What's up, guys? Rick here with a mailbag episode. That's right. I asked for really questions, comments, concerns about anything you want. Uh, really no boundaries here. And it's something I like to do every so often. This felt like a really good time to do it. Now, this time around, I wanted it to kind of be truly a mailbag episode. So to me, a mailbag is you have a bunch of questions in mailbag, you reach in, you open it up and you read it without ever seeing it before. Now, obviously I have seen some of these questions before because they were either tweeted at me or something like that, but uh, I have intentionally not seen a lot of these questions because my wife, there she is, Armina, <laughs> uh, she's going to read them. So Armina, you've been compiling these. You are going to read them and I've probably seen 20% of them. Yeah, I'd say that's about right. Um, okay. I think should I start? <laughs> I guess we should just get into it. Yeah, go ahead. See what happens. These are uh I I don't know. I don't okay, I don't even know what they are. So go ahead. Okay. Um, so the first question is from Tom Jacobs. Um, he wants to know the origin story of Rick Run Good, the move okay. to Vegas and how that came about, and when the shift to making golf content your career occurred. Okay, so I did see this and um the, there were there was a lot of these questions, which is like, what's the origin story? How did you start doing this? All that stuff. So I'll just I'll just knock it out here with with Tom's question. So so thanks, Tom. Um, I my background is in marketing automation, uh, which is essentially just working in giant databases. And um, as I was working in giant databases, I realized I could make databases, and I could make sports stats databases or golf stats data databases, databases. And that's what I did. Um, and I just kind of grew it as much as possible, put as much information in as I could and used it for whatever projections, making lineups, making bets, whatever that might be. Um, when I wanted something to, I wanted a way to always be able to access it. So I put it onto a website that was, I think it was password protected. I was the only one who had access to it, but I could access reports and my data um, wherever I was. Then I started sharing it with my buddies. They liked it. I said, maybe this is something others are going to like. Maybe I should start charging for this. And kind of around the same time, um, I was going on YouTube to look for strategy to look for information on how to set lineups, how to make bets, things like that. And it was it's a very, very secretive industry, as you can imagine. So I um, would then, I said, okay, well, if this information isn't available, I'll, I'll just make this information. So I started making YouTube videos. So those two things kind of running parallel to one another. Um, and as uh, one grew, the other grew. And uh, when it finally grew, big enough for me to um make it my full-time job i did not not with um without before getting the blessing of my of my wife was that a was that kind of a crazy weird moment to make this our our or my full-time job yeah it was i remember when we were we were like at that pokey place and we were talking about it and we were like i don't know maybe this is a good idea maybe not and then we both were like <laughs> let's just not. make the leap yeah, and it's super terrifying, and uh, it's probably been the best decision ever. And now you are also a part of this two 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 man team, Armina Rick Run Good uh, is now a two person team as of yep. like a year and a half ago. Yep. Yeah. So I was an optometrist, and then I left that, and then joined this. And. The other question that I get a lot is like, how did you get hooked up with CBS? Um, that was really just, um, I don't know if like, okay. So when, when the, the federal gambling law got repealed, uh, CBS, which is what I love about them was one of the first ones to be like, we're all in on, on gambling here. So we're going to really embrace this. Uh, the first put first cut podcast already existed, but I think it was like week weekly or maybe even monthly. And they wanted to kind of ramp it up, introduce a DFS, a betting angle. Um, and I got the opportunity to kind of host it for a bit as a little bit of a test. And then, um, and then we were able to work out terms and, and, and kind of the rest is history. So that's kind of how I got hooked up with CBS, which I know is uh, a common question as well. I think I covered that one. Yeah, that was good. Okay, so switching <laughs> gears. 
This one is from Ari Foot. Um, okay. Do do you put T fives or ten bets on all your outrights or twenties or higher on the long shots? Okay, uh, so top top five, top twenty, top ten bets on all my outrights. No, generally just the longer ones. Call it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the comments said. Maybe call it like 25 to one or longer. Actually, sometimes it's probably even like 35 to one or longer, which is really just an insurance policy for golfers who might not have a ton of huge win equity, but are going to um, pop near the top of the leaderboard. Off the top of my head, I feel like Mackenzie Hughes could fit into this category, right? I feel like, um, you know, even like Kevin Kisner's of the world, guys that are going to a couple times a year finish T5, but might not win. These are the guys that um, you don't want to lose everything with. Uh, I would rather I'd rather take the outright number in full, not feel like I have to make my own each way for some of the shorter guys. So no, it's not it's not everyone. It's generally just the longer odds uh, because those are the ones that are obviously less likely to actually actually win the golf tournament. Um, Jay asks, what are your new goals? Maybe broadcasting for a network, network golf show, golf channel, et cetera. Or are you content with your current status, which is great, but I feel you are never satisfied. Uh, thank you. Have a great on-air persona and excellent interview skills. Cheers from wow. Vegas. Oh, thanks, Jay. Oh, if it's Jay from Vegas, I if it's that I know a Jay from Vegas. I'm assuming it's that Jay from Vegas. I don't know. But uh oh. thanks, Jay. Um, I don't know. This might be a better question for you. Like, I, am I ever content? I mean, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you're not. You're definitely not complacent, and you're definitely never like, okay, this is this is good enough. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, without um, so uh, I don't know if there's specific goals, right? But I think that um, without giving too much away, I yes, I'm trying. I'm trying to get more involved in things as you can imagine. Uh, but I think the, the main goal would be whether it's for me or whether it's for somebody else to start bringing the DFS and the gambling, um, side of golf more mainstream. That is an area that has, uh, generally been Untapped. I mean, listen, the PGA Tour didn't even acknowledge that gambling existed as of like two years ago, right? So it, it's something that they have just started to get into in terms of showing odds on leaderboards and matchups and stuff like that. But um, there's there's still significant golf is still significantly behind a lot of other sports. So that's that is certainly a goal. I think, um, and, and I do set a lot of goals, and 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 I, I my main goal will always continue to be building the best tools I can. Like, like that's my pure passion. That's rickrungood.com building, um, the best tools that I can possibly do, adding more data like that, that to me is the core and everything else is great as well, but that's what I love doing. So that will always be a, a pretty significant focus and a pretty, pretty big goal. Um, this is a good one. Sal Vetri says, how do you explain to new people in your life what you do for a living? <laughs> This is so hard. Um, actually, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's not that hard. So I, well, we we had to like figure out what we were gonna say. Uh, we we usually say we run a golf media company. That that's the line, and ninety nine percent of the time it, it ends there, and they go, "Oh, cool, sounds great." And then if anybody's like, "Oh," I play golf. Like, what do you mean by that? Then then you can go into it a little bit further, but it's. It's it's really weird because I I see myself as having like like three full time jobs. Uh, like one's the website, which is the biggest portion of the income. Um, one is content, which would be like YouTube stuff, and one would be like what some people classify as like talent, like going on CBS Sports, CBS Sports HQ, doing things for like other networks or other or, you know media outlets. So I kind of see it as like a like a three headed beast. Um, so it, it, it's difficult to say that when I'm meeting somebody new. Uh, so I just say golf media company. And then if they're really curious, I'll dive into it from there, but that has worked for us so far, but it took us a while to yeah. get to that. Didn't it? Yeah. We tried, there were we tried a lot of different, 
yeah, a lot of iterations before Golf we got to website. like, okay, this is, yeah. yeah. But then they were like confused about that and they didn't know if you did any podcasting or anything like that too. So anyway, um, mm. okay. So PD asks, do you ever hold back anything on DFS so the public isn't also writing all of your guys? That's a good question. <laughs> it is, but no. Um, <laughs> one, one, uh, I do not move the needle that much. So there's no point in me holding anything back. It, it, there, like if I literally moved the needle, uh, you could argue that a content cr creator would be in a better position not telling people what they're doing. However, the whole Rick Run Good brand is basically built on transparency, which wouldn't make any sense. And uh, also, especially in golf, super volatile, right? So even if I told, even if I was trying to pull a fast one, keep guys away, who knows if they're ever going to be successful. Uh, I could talk up guys that I'm not planning on playing, but who knows if that's ever going to be successful. There's just, I don't like the idea of it. It doesn't make much sense. It would almost be too hard to do. And at, and at, and at, at the very least, I couldn't do it if I wanted to, because I don't move the needle. Um, the other thing would be, and, and people know this in the Slack all the time, uh, like most, the, the Slack could probably guess my $200 single entry lineup every single week. And then when that a contest starts, uh, they will see that all of the guys that I've been talking about all week, I have played and I will just live and die with those guys. Okay. Um, Dylan Schmittler, what's the Schmittler. over under, <laughs> what's the over under on Bryson majors in 2022? Uh, I mean, the real number is probably 0.5, right? Like, is he going to win one or not? Um, I'm pretty bullish that he, I mean, he, he could win the masters, right? I think the whole thing that he's designed is built around Augusta national. And if you remember, he barely made the cut, uh, was it in November or April? Barely made the cut. Was that in November or April? I guess it may have been November. Uh, but play much better on the weekend. Remember he was having like the dizzy spells or whatever. I don't know. But the way that he's designed is built for Augusta. It will also be incredibly beneficial at U.S. Opens. So PGA Championships, fine. Open Championships, it might not be that good, but we'll find out. I, I, like I would not be remotely surprised. The real number is 0.5, um, but I, I really do like Bryson's chances of, of, uh, of winning a, a major this year. Um, this is a Twitter DM. What's something you're passionate about that you rarely talk about? I know what this is. Really? Um, all right, well, let me go and then we can guess. So I, I don't have many passions that are not <laughs> golf. Like golf is a pretty, there was a live, there was a question in the live chat that was like, tell me what you did this week that wasn't golf related. And I literally had no answer. I just had like zero answer. So, um, I would say I, two things come to mind. Um, 95% of my diet is plant-based. Uh, Armina is 100%. And it's that very, you know, scary vegan word uh, that, that most people don't want to talk about. But I, it, it makes me feel better to eat like that, not only morally, but I, I had my gallbladder removed a couple of years ago. And it's much easier for me to, to live that way. But um, I don't, we don't talk about that at all. I mean, we talk about it at home, but I don't really talk about that anywhere else because I know like the idea of like, oh, this vegan vegans have a PR problem yeah. and they should <laughs> not, they should, they should go by plant-based and not vegans. Cause people don't want to hear it about it all the time. I was going to say pizza. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. That's the other one. Hold on. So, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> the, I was asked because, uh, it's like, I don't know the, the, I don't know. Yeah. You're a vegan. I'm almost there, but I don't say vegan. Yeah. I say plant-based. Cause I think that's, I think that's better PR. Additionally, I'm into pizza making. Okay. <laughs> so this is something that has uh, uh, consumed me for a while. I've been on and off. I've got a 36 hour dough out there right now, ready to be used. Although I don't think it came out great. I'm probably gonna have to redo it, but I'm, I'm, I'm into pizza making. So maybe some uh, tweets uh, of my pies coming to a tweet near you. 
I think that's it. Plant plant based pizza. Most, it's mostly yeah, it's mostly golf <laughs> stuff, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, okay, so Mark Riggs, someone, maybe even you, over the last week mentioned having a medical exemption to use a cart, but no caddy. What are your thoughts on that? And could it ever be a reality? Asking for a friend, Tiger. <laughs> Ooh, um, I don't think it was me. I don't think I mentioned that. But so I don't think it'll happen. Uh, so, so I guess the idea is whatever exemption Tiger could get to ride a cart instead of walking. Um, so kind of multiple parts here. I don't think it'll ever happen. The PGA Tour and golf in general is um, historically – conservative and slow to change things like that. I just don't see it happening. The caveat is if it were, if they were ever going to do something, it would be for tiger, right? That's, that's the caveat to get tiger into the game. And, and it would be to me a PGA tour rule, not like a RNA worldwide golf rule, right? Because the PGA tour could say, here's our, our moneymaker, our, our guy, we want him to play PGA tour events. Maybe he goes play, plays the open championship. He's got to walk. Uh, but PGA tour events, like that's the only path for it. I don't think it'll ever happen because it would be, I, I just think it'd be, a, I mean, there'd be an outrage for it. I, I don't think it'll ever happen, but that's, that's the only kind of way I see it going is for tiger in PGA tour events. Only. Um, Elijah Weichers says, from a strokes gained perspective, can the whole field technically gain strokes? If you are comparing to years of data, how does that square with some players always losing strokes gained and some gaining in a tournament? So without uh, going down every avenue, uh, the short answer is no. Um so there's different there's there's different ways, right? So strokes gain total, which is just your score against the average score, it would be impossible for every golfer to either gain or lose because um, every golfer in a field because their scores are literally being compared to one another. So if every golfer shot a 59, no, that's a bad example. If every golfer shot under 60, which would still be a ridiculous score, a ridiculously amazing score, someone's gonna have to be the worst. And the average, someone's still going to, there's guys who are going to be above and below the average. So no, that's not possible. Now, if you, so the other way, and I've seen some guys backdoor into strokes gained this way, it's not the best way to do it, but like, okay. So if you, over one round of golf, uh, just compared golfers to the, the like many year baseline, like a eight foot putt is 50, 50, right? So if, Every single golfer makes every put every putt from eight feet. They would all be gaining strokes putting, but that's not really how it works because you have to you have to get to the strokes gain total number for that round anyway, and they're being compared against other people on the course that day. So um, I, I think I see where you're going with this. If you were only looking at overall long term baselines, technically I guess it could, but that would be an inaccurate way to do it. It wouldn't make any sense, and you'll never see it. So short answer is uh, no, but. Uh, your brain is working in funky ways that you came up with that question. <laughs> okay. Mark Fox. <laughs> Mark Fox asks your top three golfers that you would like to see winning a major in 2022. Oh, so I could go with like, who do I actually want to see? Who would be the best for business or who would be the best for like, like Ricky Fowler winning a major would be kind of cool. Uh, that would be like the comeback, right? Tiger, obviously. Victor, obviously, um, th that's not the top three. So Tiger, I think, has to be one because not only would it be amazing, but I, I mean, it would be, it would be insane. You think what he did in 2019 is crazy? It would be absolutely insane. Um, Victor winning one would be good. Who's one who has not, like, who has not won a major that really needs one? Adam Scott. <laughs> You just want to see Adam Scott like on TV yeah. more often. <laughs> um, I mean, it would have been Rom until he until he just won one. Xander, Xander would be kind of cool. I'll go Tiger, Xander, Victor. Okay, that's good. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> Who would you pick? Next Adam question. Scott. Adam Scott. Adam Scott. Care dot Affy Barnrat. Nice. I just like saying that name. <laughs> and I mean, another one for Victor. I don't know. Oh, wait, has he won one? No. Okay. One for Victor. <laughs> one for Victor. The the best for business would be Tiger, Fowler, Spieth, maybe. Just like getting that thing going again. Like that'd be good for golf, I think. Um, okay. That's fun. Okay. Fun game. Um, so this is a Twitter DM. As an RRG subscriber, so I don't know if that means recurringgood.com, probably. Oh, well, what's the rest of the question? Uh, is there anything new we can expect for 2022? Oh, that doesn't really help. So that could be <laughs> YouTube or I guess the website. Yeah. I, it's got to be the website, the website, right? Yeah, probably. Okay. So I guess the answer for both is is yes. I mean, YouTube will always be a constant improval, uh, improval, improvement on things um, to the best of my ability. And uh, the website... Yeah. So I, I don't know if, if you've been paying attention, um, there's something I think that's pretty special that's happening on the website right now, which is data. It's probably becoming one of the larger golf data websites available. I mean, by the time um, we get a couple months or weeks into 2022, it's going to have Every single round ever played on the PGA Tour by strokes gain metrics. Every single round played on the Senior Tour ever. Every single round played on the Corn Ferry Tour ever. Uh, there's already 10 years of European Tour data loaded in there. Um, and the, the 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 point of that's kind of really a big step one is to load in all of that because then you don't have any gaps, right? So golf is not just a game where everybody plays on the PGA Tour or everyone plays in just America. So once you have Corn Ferry data, PGA data, senior data, Euro data, you've now basically run the gamut of where everybody could play for, for the vast, vast, vast majority of players. Um, and then now when you're looking at a cheat sheet or you're looking at a golfer profile and a guy who has split time between the Corn Ferry Tour and the PGA Tour, um, and it, this is already on the website, this has already been updated, but like you're not just miss, you're not just getting the PGA Tour data. You're getting the Corn Ferry Tour data as well. If they go over and play overseas for six weeks and come back, um, you're getting that data as well. So you're seeing realistic trends. There was there was a time probably a year ago or two years ago where like you know Billy Horschel's year this year would have been kind of missed out on, right? Because he won at the match play and he won in Europe. Match play is not a shot link event and Europe wouldn't have been supported. Now it is. So now all that data is in there. So like that's part one is just this massive influx of data, which is already been incredible and will be better every single day. So as of right now, it's every PGA tour round dating back to like 2010, every PG, every corn Ferry round, every senior round and every Euro event for 10 years, it'll be more than that. Um, then it goes to the tools, which will always be big improvements to try to make the user experience better, the research process uh, easier, but still robust. Uh, I continue to get better at making tools all the time. I've got some ideas. The custom model will have big updates. So yeah, the short answer, yes, I could talk about this stuff for an hour and a half, but uh, lots of good things coming for rickrungood.com in 2022. That sounds very exciting. Um, you know about you custom, act like you just heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of the custom model, mm. Nathan Baum asks, what is the difference between the custom model you build on the Monday DFS pods versus the model you discussed on the Tuesday best bets pods? Ooh, okay. Um, Monday's custom model is literally a tool on rickrungood.com that is called custom model. And it allows you to choose any time frame, any um, stats that you want, and apply weights to those stats. And then it ranks those players accordingly. The model that I talk about on the Tuesday show is also on rickrungood.com. It's called the Tournament Predictor Tool, where that is actually a tool that is simulating the results of the tournament 1,000 times. And then showing you how often a golfer is finishing first, top five, top 10, top 20, K 
comparing that to the odds. So that the, the, the calculations are different because you as the user of the custom model, you can choose rounds, uh, stats that are important to you, all that good stuff and weigh them. Uh, the, the, the tournament predictor is kind of like my little secret sauce that takes into account, um, recent form, long-term form course history when available. Additionally, um, it, it really likes volatility, right? Cause that's how you win golf tournaments. It really, really likes volatility. So it's just kind of like my, my secret sauce. So they are, um, they are different. Um, Brady asks what? I don't know how long, this... like, should I be, how, uh, how many are left? Like, should I be going faster or slower? Like how many questions? There's only left? four. There's only four left. Oh, okay. Jeez. Yeah. I could have taken more time on some of these. Okay. <laughs> um, it's okay. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. I bet. <laughs> so Brady asks, what to this point has been your favorite golf moment to cover? Oh, God. Uh, there's been so many good ones. I think that, um, I will remember the 19 presidents cup a lot. That was the first event I did with CBS. It was overnight. So it stuck out and it was really one of the first events that I really covered, um, like doing this full time. So that will always, I'll remember that. Um, the Hideki masters was awesome. Not only because of the way he played, but he had the quote about, I was sitting in my car playing video games or whatever on his phone during the rain delay. Then the huge win for Japan, just awesome. I'm trying to think what else there's probably, um, what was I at in person? I went to the uh, U.S. Open at Torrey, but I was only there Thursday. But that's just a different – that's a different feel. Um, so I'll always remember that. But I don't – I don't know. Probably President's Cup and Hideki's Masters, I think. Yeah, I remember those. And if you um, remember them, then I definitely remember them. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Okay, so this is a Twitter DM. I'm curious about your move to OC, Orange County, and then to <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> Not sure if you talked about those before. Favorite Orange County slash LA golf courses as well. Okay, you can stay here for this one. Um, so originally from Philadelphia, I, I think people, when they notice the accent, say, are you from Philadelphia or something like that? And I say, yes. Um what if I said no and I just lied about it? I was like, not what you're talking about. Uh, so moved to Orange County five or six years ago because weather is very good. We still have family in Orange County, uh, so we frequent back there quite often. The move to Vegas, Armina, was um, needed a bigger place, needed a kind of a dedicated studio. We were both working remotely. It didn't really matter where we lived. We started looking around a couple different places, visited Vegas. It was great. Housing was cheaper, no state income tax. Yeah, That's, the list goes on. That, yeah, right? We couldn't have afforded this place in California. Um, we have a pool, which is crazy. Never had a pool before. All that yeah. good stuff. Yeah. I the agree. All the above. Fav all the above. The favorite courses in OC. So, uh, I mean, Pelican Hills, awesome. The two courses there. Monarch Beach, uh, play that quite a bit. Those are probably my, those are probably my my two favorite. Strawberry Farms in Irvine would be good. Okay, sorry, I could talk about those for a while. <laughs> um, okay, this is a Twitter DM. Also, if you had to pick a winner for the Masters now, who would it be? <laughs> it's always one of these. Um, <laughs> I don't know. This is this is always just a great way to make me look silly. I I, I think that. All right, so a couple of items. Uh, you could go with the pure course hit, like 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 if you said Jordan Spieth, how could you ever be wrong, right? The guy's just absolutely dominant. How how could you be wrong about that? Um, the guys that I think are trending in the right direction, like Justin Thomas, right? I don't remember what his most recent finish was, but his his results were getting better and better and better every single year. It's just a matter of is one year he going to putt well? That there's your there's your question. If the answer to that is yes, he wins one of these eventually. Um, I am likely more bullish on most, 
that Bryson will win one. Now, Augusta National is so unique that I don't know if that's uh, now or in the next five or 10 years. The other problem with that is he's not allowed to use green reading books there. Now, the caveat to that is the more he plays it, the more he will have likely made his own green reading book. So I would actually probably like to take Bryson. Bryson wins a Masters in the next five years, something like that. Um, this year, I would probably take Victor. No, I would probably just Victor answer. For <laughs> I'd probably take... I think JT is a very likely candidate. The more you play it, the better he is. He's got the baseline of being a ball striker, just got LASIK done. If he can putt, he's ready to rock and roll. I'll take I'll take I'll take JT. Who would you take? Oh, I was not expecting this. <laughs> um I mean Rom, I don't know. Is that too easy? Yes, probably too easy. Um <laughs> Okay, the, who would I want to see is Rory. Rory would complete the career Grand Slam. Ooh. And okay. Adam Scott's already won a Masters, so you don't have to worry about him. He'll be just fine. <laughs> um, this is the last one. I think this is actually my favorite question. This is also okay. a Twitter DM. If you got 100 mulligans around, do you think you could win a PGA Tour event or at least make the cut? <laughs> Wait, say that again. If I got a hundred mulligans a round, yeah. So four rounds of a hundred mulligans each. Well, oh, I'd win. two. Do you think you could make the cut? No, I'd win. I mean, you think you could win a hundred mulligans a round? So hold on. Let, wait. Let's be. These are not a hundred strokes. These are a hundred mulligans. So I still have to hit the shots. So if I yes. hit, so if I'm on number one and I hit it out of bounds and I use my mulligan. I've used one mulligan, but I still have to hit that shot. And if I do it again, I got to use another mulligan. So it's not like a hundred strokes, which which is actually mulligans would make it harder. But yeah, like I mean, couldn't I hit six iron and win this? Right. So all right, here's Wait, one. Thing. But you have to keep in mind something else. This is a PGA yeah. Tour event, right? So there's like people there, like Adam Scott's right next to you, <laughs> like. Aren't you nervous? Every conversation Ed ba ends back to Adam Scott. <laughs> yeah, so I would be, but um, okay. So for reference, I'm like a seven and a half handicap, which means I shoot in the low 80s. And if I were to play a PGA Tour event in PGA Tour conditions, I would probably shoot a 110, 120, maybe. I don't know. That might be a lot. Um, if you gave me 100 mulligans, See, this is actually kind of interesting because <laughs> it's not like a hundred best balls, right? So if like I'm in the middle of the fairway and I hit a shot that lands on the green, I guess I wouldn't use a mulligan there, but I, because if I use the mulligan, I, I'd have to hit another shot, maybe get it closer, but I'd have to use that. So it's actually kind of strategic on how you'd use your mulligans. Um, yeah, I, I would. I mean, I use them a lot putting and around the green. Around the green, for sure. The only problem would be is if there were a lot of holes with forced carries. So, like, if I had to carry it, I don't know, 240, 50 yards or something with a driver, that would be very difficult for me. And there might not be enough more. Like, I would just have to take a penalty at some point. Um, I think I'd absolutely win. 100 rounds is too many. So you think you would make the cut and you would win? The question was a hundred around. So okay, so if I shoot one ten in a normal tour conditions, and I use a hundred mulligans, can I shave? Well, I have to shave like 50, 45 strokes off. I think I could. A hundred okay. mulligans is so many. A hundred mulligans a week. I might not make the cut. That's how good these guys are. That's how tough these courses are. But a hundred a day, that's uh what's a hundred divided by 18? How many is that a hole? It's five a hole, six a hole. Yeah, I'd win. Actually, I don't know. I'm sorry to think I win, but uh, uh the nerves would definitely be be scary. But I I I'd win. I'd win. I need a good caddy. And you're like playing I, from the all the way back 
tees, right? You have to play from the same ones as they do. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. And but you like, still okay, think but like, with all those okay, things. So, but, okay, so when you tip out Summerlin at 6,900 or no, 7,000 yards, like it's only going to be maybe 200 yards longer. Okay, how about this? I could win at Summerlin from the tips uh, with 100 mulligans a day. I could win that. Actually, no. You know what? No, I wouldn't win at all. Oh, my God. Because, because here's the problem. Sorry. Here's the problem. I would never make enough birdies to win. I was just thinking, would I like make? No, I would never win. Sorry. Because I would have to make like eight birdies a day. Right? I don't know. How do mulligans work? Is it just the off the tee or is it any time? No, you can use them anywhere, but you, you, get, you get to just re-hit the shot. It's like a redo. Okay. So if I hit a drive... So could you it do goes, it on like a putt? So here's the thing. So, 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 oh yeah, I would use them a lot for putting because that would be the best okay. place to use them. Yeah. Um, but if you hit a drive that's in the fairway, I'm not going to use a mulligan there. But then I have to hit a shot that gives me a chance to make a birdie. So I might have to take like, I mean, it might take me 10 shots from the fairway. No, I would yeah. never win. I'm sorry. I would no, never I win. So. I would, um, and actually, so here's the thing. Summerlin's a terrible example because even the cut line would be like six or seven under. I would need to play like uh, somewhere hard, but not, I, I would need like the winning score to be like 12 under so that the cut line's like three over. Because I could make pars all day with yeah. 100 mulligans around. So you think but you I don't could think I'd ever make cut. enough birdies. Yeah. So, wow. Okay. Great question. <laughs> um, no, I would not win, which is crazy to think, uh, with 100 mulligans a day. But I would definitely make the cut. And the harder – with par being a better score, I think, helps me. Mm -hmm. Wow. How many mulligans do you think it would take for me to make the cut? <laughs> See, that's the problem. So that's the problem with mulligans is you'd eventually have to hit the shot, which is like, yeah. might never happen. No offense. Yeah, it would never. Yeah. It, but the like, answer is infinity. <laughs> but like, right. It's not knocking off a hundred strokes or 50 strokes or 30 strokes. It's like mulligans is a great question because you actually have to eventually hit the shot. And I don't know if I could hit enough birdie look shots to win. Great question. Twitter DM. <laughs> Mind blown. Yeah. Is that it? That is all of them. Yeah. Okay. Great job. Tip of the cap to Armina. Thank you very much for your services for today. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, okay. Thank you. That'll do it. I don't have much to plug or say. Hope you enjoyed it. If anything else comes up, make sure to uh, leave a comment. Happy to interact there. Happy to interact on Twitter at Rick Run Good. I pet will uh, pet your dog and I'll talk to you guys soon. <laughs> Goodbye.